Today, we move on to our second general affirmative defense, self-defense and defense of others. And often the defense is referred to just as self-defense, even though the rule is the same for defending another person as well. So even if I say self-defense or you read self-defense in some of the readings, uh, the rule can be extrapolated to apply to defending another person as well. Now, as I mentioned, this uh, the doctrine surrounding self-defense and defense of others emerges originally from justification and necessity, the idea being that there are going to be instances when if you're threatened personally, uh, in some cases your property is threatened, um, your life is threatened, you would be justified uh, in using a proportionate amount of force uh, in contra to uh, that attack by another person. Uh, but the doctrine has is, is evolved on its own, including uh, the burden shifting that was uh, recognized in the Dixon case at the beginning of this chapter, meaning that in self-defense and defense of other cases, the government has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was not engaged in self-defense or defense of others. Uh, but let's uh, set out some of the basic rules here. In truth, any of these statements is subject to the qualifier that every statute is, um, you know, different and uh, has potential nuances and aspects that are not covered by these general uh, statements. Uh, so this is an area where statutes uh, have a lot of variation and as we'll see in our application exercise of looking at the shooting of Trayvon Martin by George Zimmerman, uh, we'll look at the Florida statutes and how they have some of these as these similarities to these general principles, uh, but in fact, there's variations in the way the law is worded. Um, so in general, the justification for the use of force, similar to the Robinson uh, excerpt at the beginning of the chapter is uh, force, I mean, of, of this section, force is justified against a person's uh, subjective or objective belief in an imminent threat of unlawful force, meaning that depending upon the jurisdiction, you might have a subjective or objective test. Objective is signaled by a reasonable person. Uh, if it doesn't say, the court could find it to be subjective or objective. Model penal code jurisdictions follow a subjective or a more subjective approach, consistent with its overall theme of looking at the uh, view of the world from a defendant's idiosyncratic or uh, you know particular perspective. And common law jurisdictions historically have tended to use a more objective test. But in reality, this is a case where there's a continuum, and specific jurisdictions end up often between those two polar uh, categories. Notably, the threat of force must be imminent, and it must be unlawful. It cannot be, um, say, from a police officer or for somebody else uh, exercising self-defense. And then we see a similar structure for the use of deadly force, meaning that you're using a weapon that's a deadly weapon or engaged in conduct that risks the death of another, like pushing them off a cliff or something along those lines. Uh, deadly force is justified against a person's subjective or objective belief in an imminent threat of unlawful threat of serious bodily injury, including kidnapping and uh, rape. Some jurisdictions use grievous bodily injury here. There might be a difference there. Uh, but the notion is you cannot use deadly force, say, if somebody merely slaps you or lightly pushes you. That would be a disproportionate response. And so a person is not permitted under the law to use deadly force in the reaction to any force. It has to be something that is going to give rise to a serious or grievous bodily injury. And you'll notice both of these general statements uh, revolve around a person's belief uh, because uh, mistakes here can uh, still result in successful self-defense or defense of other um, arguments at trial. This differs from our other affirmative defenses where mistakes are not clearly integrated. And so defendants here are afforded an extra bit of latitude, meaning that it doesn't mean that that the victim doesn't in fact have to have threatened uh, another person, there will be allowances for beliefs. And I'll talk about the implications of mistaken beliefs, particularly to the model penal code in a bit. Um, and then there is a exception for the use of either deadly or non-deadly force, which is if you're the initial aggressor in a conflict, you don't then get to argue uh, that, um, you were justified in response to the fight that you started. And this includes provocation to cause injury, saying things that are designed to provoke another person into a fight, you are still considered an initial aggressor. 
However, and this is a big however in our deadly force cases, statutes are often unclear as to whether the initial aggressor can switch between uh, the original conflict using non-deadly force and then the one using deadly force. And this is some relevance for our uh, George Zimmerman hypothetical as well as a couple of cases uh, listed or, or discussed herein. Um, and this is a notable um, omission or problem in lots of our statutes uh, because even if somebody starts a fight, um, they may not maintain that initial aggressor status if it's the other person uh, who suddenly escalates to uh, the use of lethal or deadly force. Okay, let's talk about some of the other principles that uh, underlie these basic statements. Uh, we have core areas of protection, meaning that you are, your force your use of force is going to be limited or proportional to what is being protected. Because if it's your body, uh, then the general statements apply. But what about things like property? Well, property does not get the same allowance. You do not get to shoot and kill somebody merely to protect, um, say, a, a nice laptop or a car. Uh, although many people might believe that to be the case, uh, generally the rule is uh, that uh, property receives less protection. However, real property, your house, well, that's different. I'll get to that in a second. But sort of movable property should not be afforded that uh, same uh, rule. And so your body and your home uh, get core protection, meaning deadly force can be uh, justified, uh, whereas uh, simple property loss does not ordinarily give rise to that. It has to be the property loss in combination with a threat to yourself, meaning that, say, a mugger who is armed is inherently threatening your body. So it's not so much about the property they're demanding from you, your wallet, your watch or whatever. It is about uh, the fact that they're also threatening your body. Um, many jurisdictions include provisions for preventing escape and particularly for uh, deadly force to be used when preventing somebody escaping, say, the commission of a felony and so forth. Um, these laws have, have, you know, some questionable legality in their general statement. It's quite clear after the Supreme Court in a case, Tennessee v. Garner, um, decided that it is not enough for police officers to use deadly force or law enforcement or other agents of the state unless it can be shown that the person fleeing uh, is still representing an ongoing threat of serious or bodily injury, say an armed felon fleeing, because that weapon can be used on innocent civilians or other police officers. Uh, but this might be an instance, strangely enough, where civilians, people who are not agents of the state, might be authorized under our law to use higher levels of force than law enforcement because the statutes do seem to say that in some cases you can, uh, to prevent escape, shoot and kill another person or use other forms of deadly force even without um, the uh, ongoing threat of us. But these have not been litigated fully or tested, I think, um, because there's still a, a question as to how much authorization the state may give to civilians to use force. And it would seem strange if civilians have a higher authorization to use force than uh, recognized or deputized uh, law enforcement. Uh, home defense does get special status, as I mentioned in the core areas of protection, but I want to want to say that a home is an extension of your body. But we are talking about the sort of um, uh, physical limits to the home. It does not count your yard. It probably does not count uh, uh, a open air carport. Um, but your garage might count. There's actually some conflicting law there. But your home, certainly your bedroom, living room, kitchen, all those areas, uh, they are uh, of the type of place that sort of your home is your castle, uh, that uh, a person is allowed to use deadly force. Because if somebody is unlawfully in your home as opposed to your lawn, the presumption is they inherently represent a threat of serious bodily injury or death. And so home defense um, it allows the use of lethal uh, force. Um, now, there's been a lot of um, uh, media coverage and concern about what are known as stand your ground laws. And stand your ground laws stand in contrast to the traditional rule, which was the rule of retreat. The rule of retreat said a person if they had an opportunity to safely um, escape from an encounter where uh, deadly force might otherwise be authorized, you had to take advantage of that retreat. Uh, and so this would tend to prevent escalation. People would not uh, resort to deadly force if it was unnecessary. After all, coming from the word necessity as its core jurisdiction, the retreat of rule logically followed. The idea was you 
no longer needed to use deadly force to subdue an assailant uh, or to prevent serious bodily injury because there was another avenue, which was escape or retreat. However, stand your ground laws, which are the majority rules in this country and are not as new as many people think. They've been around for quite a while, uh, largely supported by the NRA, but also just a shift in, in thinking in many jurisdictions. Uh, the stand your ground says you don't have an obligation to retreat, meaning you can use lethal force even if there is the completely safe avenue for escape. Uh, and so this is a shift, and we'll talk about some of the consequences of this shift, but it is the majority rule in this country. Uh, lots of people after uh, Trayvon Martin was shooting, you know, really focused on Florida as being problematic and, and portrayed as an outlier. There are certain ways Florida law is a bit unusual, but not in the stand your ground context. That is something that is true in the majority of states across uh, the country. Uh, but the rule of retreat in jurisdictions that have it, so in jurisdictions that have a retreat rule, there is a castle exception, which is uh, means you never have an obligation to retreat from your home. So if there is somebody in your home and it is possible for you to go out the back door and safely escape, uh, you do not have an obligation to do so. The castle exception says the obligation to retreat ends at your home. Uh, and this is consistent with the idea that home defense is an extension of your body. It's a core area of protection. And so even in jurisdictions where you have a rule of retreat, uh, you have a castle exception. You do not have to retreat from your home. And obviously in stand your ground jurisdictions, you never have an obligation to retreat, whether it's in your home or anywhere else. Okay, so those are some broad strokes of the doctrine. Um, but there is still this lingering issue of mistake. And this is where those sort of mens rea-ish words, not mens rea, but mens rea-ish words, things like subjective belief, objective belief, reasonable belief, come into play. Because what happens if our defendant uh, mistakes uh, signs of, of violence uh, for another person. And this is particularly true when the defendants are law enforcement or um, defendants who are trying to prevent um, wrongful actions. They might be mistaken, right? They might think somebody's armed who's not. They might misinterpret a threat of lethal violence when it was not meant to be or in any ways was lethal violence. Cell phones can be mistaken for guns. So this is an area where we see a lot of high profile cases, particularly those involving law enforcement. What do we do in these mistake cases? Well, if the standard is reasonable belief, uh, then a defendant has to show, um, or I'm sorry, the defendant has to raise a reasonable doubt, uh, since the burden is on the government. I want to be clear here. They have to raise a reasonable doubt that their mistake as to the threat, say, of serious bodily injury uh, was itself reasonable, meaning that uh, mistaking a stick for a gun that's likely to be unreasonable if the test is a, a, um, a, an objective one. Whereas uh, maybe mistaking a toy gun in certain instances might be reasonable to mistake it for a real gun. It's going to depend on the specific circumstances, what the toy gun looks like, uh, what the person's knowledge of is the victim in this case. So uh, in an objective world, uh, we still are holding a person to a reasonable test and threat assessment. Uh, if it's a subjective belief, well, then even if a person is highly paranoid, even if, say, they're racist, meaning that they misperceive threats based on uh, somebody's race or ethnicity, uh, the defense would seemingly allow um, them to be found not guilty. And the burden would be on the government to prove subjectively they weren't mistaken in exaggerating the threat uh, that was not there. Um, as I said, the MPC tends to follow a subjective approach, but it does have at least some some tapping down of this concern, and I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. Um, but some common law jurisdictions follow a subjective approach, and then, uh, but traditionally the common law used an objective approach here, meaning that the mistake must be reasonable for a person to be found not guilty. Uh, but the MPC does um, recognize that sort of if you have a subjective rule here, it would tend to reward defendants who are highly paranoid, uh, trigger happy, racist, uh, homophobic, depending upon the particular context, it would it would seem to create a rule that is is um, rewarding uh, bad behavior and um, dangerous people. And so the MPC actually says if it's a lethal force case and a homicide case, meaning that somebody has died based on a mistaken belief, um, but that mistaken belief was unreasonable, 
meaning objectively it would fail uh, a reasonable person test, then the defendant is still guilty of uh, manslaughter instead of murder. Uh, and so this is what's called imperfect justification, meaning that a defendant subjectively has met the test, and so they are not guilty of murder because they thought they were engaged in conduct to protect themselves or another, and they honestly believe that. But they're still guilty of manslaughter. And this logically follows from the definition of manslaughter because the definition of manslaughter is based on recklessness. And so if a person is taking a substantial and unjustified risk and grossly deviating from a reasonable person, they are guilty of manslaughter. And self-defense does not abrogate that. Uh, and so this is the MPC's way of saying, yes, we like subjective tests. Yes, we want to focus on people's um, uh, impressions of the world. But... Uh, just because you were subjectively mistaken doesn't mean you escape all criminal liability. It just means self-defense um, uh, neutralizes the murder charge. But the manslaughter charge is available as a form of imperfect justification. Okay, so a lot of rules in the background here. And then we have four cases that, that emphasize uh, different parts of them. And the first is Connecticut v. Singleton. Uh, and this is a case that does revolve around this sort of initial aggressor problem and the interrelationship that I foreshadowed between um, uh, murder, manslaughter, in some cases accidents, which are not considered homicide at all, and then self-defense. And so our defendant in this case was arguing several of these as arguments in alternative, right? He was saying uh, accidentally um, stabbed uh, the victim in this case during an altercation. Uh, but if you don't think it's an accident, then in fact, this would only be considered negligent homicide or manslaughter because it was not uh, a intentional killing. It was just part of what was going on in a conflict after uh, the two people here were using drugs and might not have been operating uh, at their full faculties. Uh, but also, uh, if, you know, there is a self-defense claim because the defendant says uh, the other person started this fight and, uh, you know, there were statements here, you know, the victim was babbling as the defendant moved towards him and said he was going to fuck him up. I mean, there's a lot of confusion here. Uh, and in fact, it's not a, a knife as so much as a, a screwdriver. I include the, the depiction of a, a Swiss Army knife here because of the way uh, the facts are described are a little ambiguous as to uh, the full nature of the tool and screwdriver and its size here. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the defendant did not get to argue um, self-defense in the way he wanted uh, before the trial uh, uh, fact finder. And the question on appeal is, um, should uh, that the jury have been instructed differently? So you'll notice, just to start, the Connecticut here is using a reasonable uh, person test. It's an objective test. Uh, the statutory excerpt of 53.819 emphasizes reasonability at a couple places. Uh, so that means our defendant should be afforded uh, self-defense as an, uh, an argument, even if they uh, were mistaken as to the threat, if their mistake was reasonable in nature. Um, the court also notices the burden of proof is on the government here. And ultimately, um, the defendant uh, was even at the high court here, Connecticut, the court says, no, he, sh he shouldn't have gotten a self-defense argument. And I do find this a little puzzling, although I, I understand the court's reasoning. I think the court makes some arguments here that are better than others. For example, the idea that if a defendant says it was an accidental stabbing, uh, they can't therefore argue, argue self-defense strikes me as problematic. Uh, we normally allow defendants to make arguments in the alternative, right? They, they want to say that it was an accident, but it, if it wasn't, um, it was in self-defense. That's a reasonable type of argument in the alternative. And it would seem strange that defendants who honestly believe that this was all an accident would not be afforded the same defense as somebody who said, oh, no, I meant to stab him, but I did it in self-defense. Um, and so I think the court's reasoning on that point, that these two theories are exclusive of each other, um, is is wrong. Um, it would be one thing if the defendant were trying to argue it themselves on the stand, and so their story contradicted and they undermined their own credibility. But their lawyer should be allowed to present the facts and evidence in several different lights, right, and having fallback arguments. And so I do think that's an issue here. But um, perhaps the, the argument that where things are, are trickier, and as I highlighted at the beginning, is this initial aggressor problem, right? Is the victim the initial aggressor? Arguably, right? We might 
doubt the defendant's statements because they are self-serving and the victim is is dead. But the story is unfolded. Might be, the jury can arguably believe that the victim was the initial aggressor. But then the initial aggressor might shift. And the escalation to lethal force, which is not justified if there's not a threat of serious physical injury, which is the language uh, that Connecticut uses here, uh, then then it might shift to the defendant if they're the ones that, that, that move things uh, to this new lethal uh, level. And so the majority thinks that, you know, as a secondary argument, this is sufficient to deny uh, the jury instruction sought by the defendant. But there are two dissenting justices here, which I think make a good point, which is the jury um, was never given a chance to really review uh, these facts and decide what were credible insofar as uh, you would have a, a an affirmative defense of self-defense. And, um, you know, there is a knife. There is a screwdriver. You know, there's multiple weapons here. And there's reason to think that uh, the uh, victim was the initial aggressor and that our defendant here was engaged in self-defense. It might not be a preponderance of evidence. You could say it was. But all the defendant should need here because of the burden of proof is to raise a reasonable doubt. And so I'm a bit surprised that our defendant does not even you know, get a chance to present this argument to the jury. But you'll notice this theme in our four cases here, that there's a lot of discretion among the courts of whether to allow self-defense, to, to whether to say as a matter of law there's enough evidence. Um, and it's possible that, that both extremes can be wrong. Um, the defendants tend to lose in several other cases here. But in the real world, um, this is one of, this is easily the best possible affirmative defense, if you can um, argue it. Because the burden is on the government, you're allowed mistakes. Right? We never had like a mistaken abandonment or anything like that. So you're allowed mistakes. You don't have to prove, in fact, that you were engaged in self-defense. And um, because, sadly, the, the victim's dead, defendants can often frame the facts in a way that makes uh, encounters that were not self-defense seem like it. And yet, these are cases where defendants lose. But I want to mention that this is not representative of a larger trend. There are a lot of defendants, including George Zimmerman, who were able to take advantage of the very defendant-friendly self-defense laws. And it is an anomaly among our affirmative defenses, both general and specific, like abandonment. Uh, and so that's Connecticut versus Singleton. Then we move to Parida versus Alabama. Now, this case presents some very unusual dynamics because it puts us in a prison. Um, but I want to just say at the outset, there's, there's reasons for focusing on prisons here. One is there's a lot of violence in prison, and our laws still apply, and yet it often applies poorly, recognizing the, the unique dynamics of a prison situation. So there's that aspect. I think prisons are important. We have an enormous number of people in this country in uh, the criminal justice system in prisons or jails. And this is a very real scenario that plays out frequently. And so we should understand the law here and how to protect um, uh, defendants and victims in these cases. But also, prison is a per not maybe perfect, but a very good analog for the world of stand your ground. Because prisons are an environment where you can't retreat. You can't ask for an escape, and you cannot get out of prison. You're always limited and confined to a particular institutional location. And so one thing to think about with these cases is that, in effect, stand your ground laws arguably turn our whole society into a prison for purposes of self-defense law. Not saying that you're in prison, but since there's, you know, we don't treat retreat as an option in stand your ground laws because it's not important, there's something we can learn from prison cases and how they would work uh, for stand your ground cases in the outside world. So this case does deal with expert testimony here. And actually, I want to, uh, in contrast to what the majority says here, say that this is actually unusually high quality um, possible expert testimony that was excluded. The court's like, well, he can't testify as to the particular moment, the defendant, you know, at that moment in this prison and what the threats were. And that's not what expert testimony usually is. In fact, many experts only meet our defendants after the crime has occurred and try and understand their psychology and thinking and give testimony there. And that evidence is regularly, not always, but regularly admitted. Here we actually have an expert who had some previous knowledge about this particular facility. It is not speaking in broad generalities. And so it is a little surprising in, in one way, doctrinally, that 
the expert's not allowed to testify here because the expert can give a lot of information about our particular defendant's frame of mind in this situation. And this is where we do start to see a blurring of our subjective and objective tests. Because we might say, well, if it's a reasonable person, should we say a reasonable prisoner? Right. Should we say a reasonable prisoner in this particular facility? Now, all these contextual factors are usually considered outside of a subject. We, we'd always allow those under either test. But it turns out they do change what a, an objective person looks like. Because once you start adding these pieces of context, well, the notion that this defendant really thought that it was only a matter of time before they were going to be killed by the victim. And there were potential reasons to think that. And that this interaction had it played out in the real world, would have very different importance pre, you know, the, the, the interaction between the defendant and victim before the homicide. Uh, that seems notable, and it does tend to show that we're not operating on a, a binary subjective versus object, but often a continuum, um, because the, as you add contextual factors, those reflect upon what a reasonable person in that environment uh, might look like. And so at the end of the day here, um, again, we see uh, a court not really willing to afford uh, a self-defense in a case, uh, and I, because the expert testimony is excluded here, really limits the scope of any uh, um, self-defense argument. And a case where we might think it should have been afforded, um, it, it should have been allowed, um, and perhaps it's just an instance where Alabama, you know, courts don't want to encourage this sort of self-help violence. Uh, they want to encourage people to rely on prison guards and prison safety, even though it's not uh, always that helpful. Uh, but the exclusion of Dr. Haney's testimony here really limits the the ability of our defendant to make this argument. And might have been a mistake, but it might have been just because this was in the prison context. Okay, now we get to Illinois v. Green. Another case where I'm, you know, I'm, the majority's reasoning helps us understand how the law can be applied, but the application is, you know, a little, little suspect. Um, and so I'm, I'm critical of several majorities here, but I want under, you to understand the reasoning while we also um, uh, look at how the rules work here. Um, like our first case, this, this case concerns a fight that escalates. Um, and this is not unusual, right? Fights escalate. They don't always stay at the same level they start. It might start as a shove and then it becomes punching. Depending on the environment, punching could become very dangerous. But here, ultimately, the use of a baseball bat, a lethal weapon, changes things. But it doesn't change things, I think, in the way we might expect because uh, Green here is involved in a fight with his mother's boyfriend, right, the victim. Um, the victim, um, you know, hit the defendant's mom. So we have a defense of others at first and daughter during an argument. So we see a justification, at least at this point, for non-lethal force. Um, and, but the victim goes to his car and retrieves his bat. So he's actually the one introducing the possibility of lethal force here. Um, he returns. He threatens everybody with this baseball bat. So at this point, we think, well, the defendant should be allowed to use lethal force, right? This is a threat of serious physical injury to everyone involved here. But what the court does and the way it frames the facts supporting uh, the lower court here is that at some point our defendant, despite the initial disadvantage, uh, gains the upper hand and ends up on top of our victim and pummels him, right? Pummels him severely. Um, and it's this moment in time that the court feels, well, we're a rule of retreat jurisdiction. And so our defendant here should have gotten off of the victim and um, um, prevented further or, or not engaged in further violence of this sort. Um, and that's, I think, reasonable if we didn't have a lot of other facts here, um, particularly the fact that uh, even though the victim had had severe head trauma at this point, when the paramedics arrive, he's not just belligerent, he's dangerous. It takes multiple people to restrain him. Um, and so it seems like the defendant could, if we assume it's even a mistake, which I'm not sure of, that he was overreacting to the threat the victim might have represented here, um, that seems in possibly reasonable. And some of the testimony in the case even says this happened really quick, right? There's not a, a timer here uh, listing how long Green was pummeling the victim. But in the heat of this, this violent encounter, um, it doesn't seem to be that long. 
And so even though the court says that Johnson, the victim, was the initial aggressor and was heavily intoxicated, was dangerous, and was wielding a bat, ultimately they uphold the conviction here of Green. And as I, of all the cases here and, and applying the rules and the rule of treat, I think this one's the most problematic. But it's important to understand why the court's able to do this. It's, the, it's this sort of separation of fights or conflicts. It's not just one big fight, because if it was just defined as one big fight, the defendant should be not guilty, right? And they should get all the instructions they want on self-defense, clearly so. Um, but if you focus on it as two fights, right, the one that ends according to the way it's framed by the prosecution, the moment the defendant gains the upper hand, and is pummeling the victim on the ground, then that defendant either becomes the initial aggressor or is just not justified anymore. They were justified when uh, the victim was standing, but not when they are prone on the ground. And I think in a case that didn't have these extra facts about how the victim was behaving afterwards, that's a reasonable um, way to frame it. Because there are instances when one fight really becomes two. And whereas somebody represented danger early on, they might be disarmed, they might be severely injured, they might no longer be able to present an ongoing threat of lethal violence. In a jurisdiction that has a rule of retreat, the defendant should have that obligation to retreat. But because of the extra facts here, I am I think the dissent points out this there is reason to think this was not an overreaction or it was one uh, that was potentially reasonable. But you see here how initial aggressor law works. You see how mistakes are important and how the rule of retreat uh, matters. If this was a stand your ground jurisdiction, um, this case should clearly come out the other way. So this is meant to highlight the difference. But not even every rule of retreat jurisdiction has to come out this way. Um, Illinois might just be the, the hardest state to win a self-defense argument. And I think that's a, a reasonable assessment and inference from the law. Okay, the last case we get to here revol involves a doctrine that really emerges and develops in the 80s and 90s. Um, that is, I think, not really self-defense and defense of others as the doctrine has been stated at the top. Some some people want to describe this as a form of self-defense, um, uh, and I disagree with that categorization. It doesn't mean I don't think there should be a defense, but I think that the notion of a battered person syndrome, sometimes called battered spouse syndrome, battered women's syndrome, battered child syndrome, depending upon the context, I use the abbreviation that the case did, uh, and some cases use, um, and, uh, but it can be, it can occur in a lot of different people who have been traumatized by abuse. And so this is a well-documented and recognized uh, psychological phenomenon. Um, but how does it fit in our criminal law is our question here. Because the reason I don't think this fits with self-defense doctrine as we know it, and it has to be its own category, or at least such a significant exception, it has to be handled differently, is these are cases where imminence is lacking. So in all our other instances, one of the key questions for the court was the imminence of the threat of lethal force. Right? So in, in Singleton, there was this ongoing conflict. Um, in our prison case, that was line that seemed to be lacking. There was not an imminent threat. It was based on a perceived risk of a future encounter uh, by the victim attacking the defendant. Um, but in this case, um, you know, our victim has been abused uh, by uh, their um you know, former lover, and they have, um, you know, had a, a relationship uh, where they were married. And ultimately, though, um, they uh, went their separate ways, and it had been time had passed. They married other people. And so in this particular night in a faraway state from where they had originally been, uh, our defendant uh, is again encountered by uh, the victim. And this creates an extremely high level of fear uh, that is indicative, according to the expert testimony in the case, a battered person syndrome, battered women syndrome, battered spouse syndrome, whatever label we want to put here, because it's ultimately trauma borne about by abuse. And it would be difficult in this instance to say that 
at the moment, she uh, um, attacks the victim and uses the knife uh, from the kitchen, that there was an imminent threat of death or great bodily harm, which is the language uh, used in the Michigan uh, statute. Uh, the court says there's no evidence that Prieto physically attacked her again, and there's no evidence that was he was ever armed. Um, indeed, the evidence shows the defendant was the one who had to be restrained. Um, and so this cannot fit under that framing of the facts under our normal self-defense rule, right? There's just not an imminent threat. But we know in some instances, uh, people have gotten this battered person syndrome form of self-defense, even when the victim was sleeping. Uh, it's a much harder argument, but the idea there is that somebody has become abused for so long, they don't believe escape is possible. They believe the threat uh, is, is inevitable and it, it possibly imminent. And that asking them to wait to use lethal force until the person is awake and, you know, potentially um, uh, um, themselves capable of reaching arms is, is not a fair expectation of the law here. Um, and so the, these are cases where a person is allowed to use lethal force where they wouldn't be able to or lawfully under um, the self-defense and defense of others law. And so here, um, despite this, you know, uh, um, expert testimony and even the, the nature of the conflict in Michigan, um, you know, the court feels isn't isn't quite sufficient, right? In other words, um, you know, they they recognize that battered person syndrome is a thing that, that should be incorporated into self-defense law, but there's a hesitancy to really give it any full force or measure. And this is something that we see in a lot of jurisdictions. There's some jurisdictions like, you know, Oklahoma that have just really said, no, we don't want to include this in our law at all. Um, there's other jurisdictions which have recognized it and um, uh, overturned convictions and prevented prosecutions in many of these cases. And there's some jurisdictions like Michigan that are somewhere in between, where although they recognize the defense, which is, you know, recognized most jurisdictions across the country, very only a small number do not recognize it. But in any given case, they seem willing to exclude the argument and to not allow it to be properly instructed to the jurors, which means even though it's technically there, um, it's not uh, applied in a consistent manner so the defendants can argue in these unique circumstances rare, I shouldn't say unique, rare circumstances where they have past abuse by the victim, where they're extremely traumatized and experts can testify to that, they still end up allowing the prosecution sometimes with no instruction at all on this issue or an instruction that's not uh, very friendly to the defendant. And so this is an outcome we see that's, you know, I think shows a general reluctance of some judges to incorporate mental health evidence and potentially some gender bias because a lot of the people who want to take advantage of this defense are women who have been abused by men. But that's a little less uh, uh, certain. And so, um, yeah, these are, um, and, and you'll notice, in, you know, for class, make sure you read the long footnote one on the bottom, page 412, uh, because this is a big part of, you know, sort of how eminence and better person syndrome inter syndrome intersect and how courts sometimes mishandle uh, this issue. Though that's all for uh, self-defense and defense of others. We'll be doing a lot in class and application, particularly uh, with the George Zimmerman Trayvon Martin fact pattern.